Hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. I'm just trying to attract a cat. There we go. This is Kravitz. He's in a mood right now. So he might bother me a little. Are you going to bother me? You just want to chase a Kleenex. I don't think it's a good idea. Okay, you can go down now. Not for you. That was for you. Uh, yep, he's gonna bother me a little today. We also have Taco down here. Just cleaning himself. So that's what I'm surrounded by. Welcome to my Friday stream. Actually, now I have cat smudge on my glasses. Uh, welcome to my Friday stream. We're playing I Was a Teenage Exocolonist. Uh, as we have been for the last few weeks. Uh, my name is Lucas. I use he, him pronouns. I am the studio director of Silver String Media. Uh, we are a small indie game studio focusing on narrative games. Uh, we just released our first uh, major in-house title called Glitch Hikers The Spaces Between uh, in March of this past year, which uh, we're really proud of. Uh, it's sort of a calm introspection simulator as this cat walks in front of me as he is wont to do. Um, do check it out. We have lots of other little experimental games. There's a bunch of info in the uh, About section on the Twitch page here if you're watching. So, um, yeah, check us out. Give us a follow. We're going to try out this streaming thing for a while. We're going to uh, continue these Friday streams every week with ExoColonist, at least until I finish it. And, you know, we've been talking about doing some more interesting stuff with other team members and some music things and stuff like that. So if that sounds interesting to you. Or if you just want to see cats more than you want to see me. That's also, apparently, something that you will get. Um, maybe this will just become a cat stream. Do you have two hours of entertainment in you, Kravitz? No. Nothing. Empty head. That's it. Uh, so on that note, <laughs> let's get right into it. So we are playing, I was teaching Exocolonist. This is my, I think it's my fifth session. I think we're in year five. Yeah, that looks right. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a spoilers thing. Exocolonist is an amazing game, one of my favorites of 2022. And, uh, you know, one of the main things that it does narratively is it really encourages replays. Stop that really encourages replays uh, narratively as well as um, uh, sort of mechanically. Um, so we're doing some things in this playthrough. I've, I, this is my third full playthrough uh, of, of the game, and so we're going to do some fun things narratively. And in, in fact, I believe it may well be this um, this year of gameplay, today's stream, in which some, some things change for me narratively. But here we are. We're in year five. I am 14 years old, Selene. We ended uh, not quite at the beginning of the year last time. We, we did the first season, um, but here we are. The main uh, the main thrust of what I've been doing so far is uh, leading into uh, the delusions. Um, there are opportunities to try to convince people that you know the future is coming because you do and you have some visions, but uh, at times that can result in people not believing you and or uh in year early in year one i believe uh i was kind of institutionalized for a few months uh as a way to try to solve my problems so uh so yeah i'm leaning hard into that and seeing sort of what comes of it if as i do uh but now to start with we're just gonna have to uh rest i'm very stressed right now i believe at the end of last session i did some exploring and as a result quite stressed, but before I rest, I guess we can talk to our friend, Dis. You leave the front gates and see Dis talking to one of the senior sur surveyors. He listens intently to their instructions, and the surveyor hands him a satchel of instruments and claps him on the shoulder before walking away. Dis turns to you. Hey, Selene, he says. He hikes the satchel on his shoulder and gives you a shy smile. It's still kind of weird to be allowed to be outside the walls. Alone. Remember when we used to sneak out? Dis's eyes crinkle at the corners. It was so easy to avoid, Chief Surveyor Tonin, he says wistfully. Dis looks up at the sky with a thoughtful look. 
There's this big rock in the western ridges that's almost totally flat on top. When I get near it, it makes me feel... happy? He smiles. It's so strange, and it's really hard to leave. The first time I went there, I laid on top of it for so long that I almost missed the transport back. I know it's my job, but I haven't told anyone about it yet, he says. I don't know how to explain it, but it's almost like it wants to be kept a secret. I have romanced this in the past, but I think I'm not going to do that this run. I'd love to see it sometime. A weird expression passes over Dis's face before he schools it back to his trademark blank look. Maybe, he replies. I don't know. I don't think it wants that. Dis looks pretty busy, so you say goodbye and let him get back to his work. You'll have to let him keep some of his secrets for now. Kravitz? Stop that. Alright, so I do think I am just going to relax. I believe my pet is already level 2, so I don't need to relax in the park. Or maybe he's not. No, he's not level 2 yet. Okay. I'm going to go relax in the park then. Maybe my pet will level up. Relax in the park. <coughs> You visit Cal and Socks before your work shift one morning just to check up on them. As you expected, Cal has Socks out for her twice daily playtime. Hey, Selene, he says, waving. Look what I taught, so taught Socks to do. At his gesture, Socks stands up on her hind legs and wiggles her upper body at you like she's waving, too. It's impressive. <laughs> Who's a smart girl? You are. Next, Cal gestures in a circle and Socks curls up in a ball. Then he raises both hands in the air like a scary monster and Socks rears up and chitters menacingly. Cal says pew pew and Socks rolls over and sticks all of her feet in the air. You count at least 14 legs. What happens when she outgrows her box? Socks clambers up Cal's arm, almost toppling him over with her weight, and curls up uh, across his shoulders like a scarf. She looks seriously heavy. Well, people hardly use this barn anymore, Cal says, adjusting her weight. It's just storage. Maybe she can live in the rafters? You're pretty sure your mom comes in here often as the head of geoponics, but you hold your tongue. Socks hasn't been discovered yet. Maybe she's really good at hiding. How do you find food for her? Cal looks distressed. It's really hard, he admits. She eats so much right now. Tons of leaves and grasses and those rocks, of course. I think she swallows them all together and chews it up in her gut like a float cow. Her teeth look like they go all the way down her throat. I don't know if I can keep hiding how much food she eats, though, Cal says sadly. Did she get lonely? Um... Cal says, looking down at the ground. I think so. She used to sleep all the time, but now she needs to run around and climb a lot more. I still come here every morning and evening to let her out, he says defensively, and, and, and she goes back into her box right away when I tell her. She's a good dilly pillar, I promise. She knows she's not supposed to go outside without me. He pets her snout. I think maybe she's just not a baby anymore, you know? Mm. Cute. Um, I don't want to pick either of these. I like those cards. We'll keep those. You're at lunch with your parents. Sliced soy cakes and watery broth again. Great. When they put down their cutlery and look at each other, then you. Selene, your mom says, there's something we should tell you. We've tried to shelter you from some things, but we think you should know why we've been working so hard in geoponics. There's a meeting after lunch, and I want you to come with us. Ooh, uh-oh. Oh, from a past life. Okay, not a delusion, but I'll probably still say that. I already know about the food. Your parents exchange surprised looks. What? You do? Your mom asks. How? You scramble to explain that they haven't exactly been subtle. The announcement at Vertumnalia, plus how stressed they've been? You can put the pieces together. No, you didn't live it in a dream of a past life. Your mom smiles. A little boy is more mature than I realized. Still, I want you there. Sure, I'll join. You follow your parents to the council room. Mars has also tagged along, and you take a seat near them as your mom and Aunt Anne stand to address the council. After Uticot officially calls the meeting, she gestures to your mom. I'm not going to mince words, your mom says firmly. All of our efforts to increase food production in geoponics have failed, and the destruction of the fields during the last attack put the nail in our coffin. By the end of the year, the colony will run out of food. The rest of the council murmurs in concern. You and Mars exchange horrified looks. You've been doomsaying about our food supply for two years, Lulu, Red questions. Do you mean to say we're past the point of no return? Your mother nods grimly. I'm afraid so. Even with rationing, Without securing a vertumnin food source, our supplies will run out by wet season. She gestures to Anne, whose face is grave. Anne and I have gone over the supplies and come up with food plans. We've crunched the numbers. Your mom sighs and spreads her hands. I'm sorry. 
Geoponics should be producing better by now. We should have been able to wean ourselves off of soy rations. During Wormhole Transit, when we lost Geoponics in the Hell Breach, she sighs again. I know I've said it so many times, but our crops just don't grow here. We needed those algae tanks. We needed the microbial soil from Earth. <laughs> Adults grew up everything. No, it's not Mom's fault. It's not. The survival of a colony shouldn't rest on one person's shoulders. It's not fair. She's been working harder than anyone. She did everything she could. The council's the council mumbles agreement. You decide they probably never really blamed her or your dad. The only holdout is Mars, who crosses her arms and grumbles that it's clearly a problem with leadership. So what do we do now? Instance asks. Starving to death isn't an option. No, it isn't, your mom replies. We need to secure a food source this year before our rations run out. We're working double shifts in geoponics, but it's not enough. We need more people planting, tending, turning the soil. We need more hands. I can pull back the surveyors and focus on foraging native plants, Utopia offers. Even the young folks can help if they've proven themselves around the survey equipment. I'll send out a hull message later. Uh, unlock foraging in the valley in expeditions. Excellent. I'm going to be doing, I think, a lot of that. This, huh, game status, starving. Oh, great. This has been the burden of geoponics for too long, Uticott says. It's time we all step up for our future. The council nods in agreement. Your stomach rumbles ominously. <laughs> yep, things are going to change around here, sadly. Mid-pollen. Oh, I might have forgotten an early pollen thing. Oh, well. Hunger makes it difficult to do any physical tasks. Physical skill increases reduced by one. Yikes. I don't think most of my physical skills are already quite high, but that is unfortunate. I'm rested up, though, so I think I will uh, set off into expeditions and focus this year as much as possible on foraging and see what we can do. I think at this point... You know, we're, we're a little desperate. Not everything has gone wrong that could have. We, uh, we cured the Shimmer, for instance, but things are getting a little desperate, and maybe it's time to do whatever it takes to survive. Forage in the Valley. Perception and Biology. Well, I already have max perception, but that's okay. All right, so a new location to explore here. Utopia greets you warmly as you muster for your first expedition with the foraging team. So, Lane, I'm glad you could make it. We need everyone we can. We need everyone we can get out here right now, boosting our food supplies. I'm ready to sniff out those tasties. Good luck hunting out there, she says, handing you an oversized backpack. More like a basket than a pack. Use your hollow palm to identify edible and medicinal plants and throw them in here. I'll sort them back at base camp. Oh, and keep on the lookout for creatures. It's pretty peaceful out there in the valley, but even a little bug will get you if you're not careful. Go slow, pay attention to your surroundings. If you're unsure about something, don't approach it. Stay on the path and don't get lost. We don't call it the Valley of Vertigo for nothing. Any questions? <laughs> What's a fine lady like you, Jesus? Uh, will this be with me? Utopia looks like he's trying not to smile. Nah, this is good at finding new things, just not just not so much the same things over and over. You'll be okay, though, she continues. You won't be alone out there, and you're doing important work. You're about to leave when Utopia snaps your fingers. Hold up, Selene. We're also investigating some species we might domesticate. Those we'll want to tag and capture. Ideally, we're looking for herbiv orbi orbivorous creatures uh, what already live in herds and either produce something edible or reproduce quick enough that we can slaughter them for meat. If you see anything that fits the bill, tag them and bring them back. Cool. Oh, we got some eggs. Those are for me. Flower. So I do have this ability now that my perception's at 100 that I actually don't have to do encounters. I can actually just walk right past them, uh, which is useful because obviously every encounter makes your stress increase. So you only have so much time to do everything and maybe can't get very far. So I think what I'm gonna do is basically, as much as possible, skip on past every encounter and just grab all of the collectibles. That way, if I can only get through a certain number of encounters, uh, I can still grab all of the collectibles on this uh, on this expedition, and then that gives me lots of things to use um, for gifts and things like that, and if I need them for, for later, um, and 
that's sort of a, a boss encounter that's not even at the end of the zone, so we'll definitely come back and maybe even do that first. That also looks like it'll be a good one. That's another, that's definitely the boss encounter. The manticore there. Look at all these things. Okay, let's start with this one then. You might almost have missed this place, but for some reason you feel compelled to stop and look around you. There's something weird about this place, about this springy, spongy dirt. You have the faintest memory of eating the ground? That can't be right. That's right, the ground is edible from a past life. You kneel down and feel the spongy texture beneath your feet. You pull out a chunk and brush some dirt off the, the dirt? Wait, what? It all comes back to you. In a dream, in another life, you recall taking a sample of this porous substance, sponge cake, and studying it at the lab. You remember discovering that it's nutritious and can be easily cultivated. In your mind's eye, you see fields of this stuff and, and more drying out in the sun. The kitchens would take it and grind it into flour. Okay, well, that might <laughs> just about do it, huh? You dig a chunk up to bring back with you. Later, you'll take it straight to geoponics and plant it in a backfield. No need to ask anyone. You already know it's perfectly safe. By the time the other farmers notice it, you'll have a healthy crop of sponge cake ready to be harvested and turned into real cake. They'll wonder where this miracle came from, but you won't tell. I guess it might be past the point of uh, wanting to tell people about my delusional visions after all that's happened to me. You find a trippet. A large, tasty um, plant? Kind of? You've heard it sort of like an animal, too. Like a lot of creatures on Vertumnet, kind of defies classification. Whatever it is, it's huge. It's practically taller than you are. So I do know from, from past plays that these, these things are somewhat animal-like and perhaps have pain receptors, um, but uh, I think for this playthrough I'm, I'm at a point of uh, necessity. Do whatever it takes, so I'm going to harvest some stalks. You start breaking off the freshest and youngest looking shoots. The plant shudders. Uh, I'll, I'll start by analyzing the shudder, maybe get my animal's point up. Uh, card becomes red, nice. So that'll turn into a five, which means I can get a great run to start off with here. one for other gems. Wish I could put there. A couple of fives. It's also gems, so we'll do something like that. Um, is that better? 24, 25, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna, we're gonna win this. It's only the last round that matters for uh, getting the most points possible, and I'm always bad at it. So let's see, that'll be a two. Don't have any more gems. That'll be a five. Because that's giving plus two. Can't get this to be a five though, unless I do that. One, 32. Oh, that'll still be higher though, 34. Thirty-five. Is that the one point that I always miss? No, not even close. What the heck? Forty-six I could have gotten. I never know what I'm missing. Yeah, this plant is alive and sentient like an animal, and is definitely not happy that you're ripping its limbs off. It's hard to tell if it's in pain, really, but you'd say discomfort, at least. All the same, you need food. It keeps shuddering. You hear a low, long whistle and realize it's coming out of the trivet's holes like a very quiet bagpipe, slowly contracting. Oof. Uh, yeah, so I think this is, again, I've, I've talked a little bit about what I wanted to do with this uh, playthrough, and I do think this might be a bit of a turning point. Uh, a little bit of a less pacifist run than I have done in the past. Um, a little bit of, of whatever it takes to 
support the colony and, and especially support my parents and the work that they're doing. It's a large enough trippet that you're able to completely fill your basket before even touching the tender innermost meat. The trippet is looking kind of bare, but you're sure, you're sure it will grow more stalks. You make note on your map of where it is, but oddly, you never find it again. I hmm, wonder why. It walks away. Uh, ooh, extra gear slot from Animals 2. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick note of that. Two animals is the extra gear slot. I like to try to keep a few notes like this so I remember for for later runs. Uh, but that means I can, so I can equip something else. So I'm getting a plus two to red challenges and the plus ten to combat. I have my pet. I mean, probably just this cool jacket. It gives such a bonus to persuasion. I think that'll be nice to have on. We still have lots of stress, so we'll do a few of these random encounters here. A line of termite-like insects crosses the path here. Curious, you follow them to their destination. A massive sponge-like hive of crawling bugs writhing with life. The bugs are tending to larvae nestled in the holes of the sponge, feeding on the rich royal jelly that oozes from the hive. You step in for a closer look and hear a warning hiss from above. Atop the hive is a queen, whatever it is. Wait, no, she is the hive. Wait, this is a squeeger hive. Her abdomen has swollen and lodged in the ground here, rendering her immobile, but not defenseless. The Hive Queen groans and growls at you, and the air prickles with the burning flavor of acid. She must have some sort of defensive acid spray. That jelly looks pretty edible, though. Let's do it. Whatever it takes. Let's through the last card. Oh, I don't like the plus 10 distress ones, so I think this is going to be a... This is going to be a challenge that we're not going to max out fully unless we absolutely have to. Uh, set to four. Interesting. I love the card becomes a four there. I guess we just have to do something like that. Gems. Nice. That is a good combination. Okay, so we just need 26 now. Can I do that without taking the extra stress? Reduce that and take me down to 25 if I change those. Doesn't make a difference. Hmm. That's the lowest otherwise. Uh, that's not a run. 25 right now. If I make that a run. 28. Okay, cool. So that run makes the difference, which is interesting. Let's do it. Still not as high as it could have gotten by a fair margin, because apparently I'm just bad at that. Ooh. Stress, but kudos and food. Awesome. You get in there and squeeze out some jelly from one of the Hive Queen's many holes, somehow managing not to get sprayed too badly by her acid. Some lands on your arm and the back of your hand and sizzles briefly, but you keep your calm long enough to escape with your bounty. All right, so getting some good food on this uh, on this expedition, so we might end up being okay. I think especially with that sponge cake. Your path is blocked by a massive eight-legged xenofauna, something between a spider and a squid and a bear. It's in a rage, grunting furiously and bashing itself against trees and rocks at random. You duck and hide as it glares in your direction, its breath heaving and dozens of eyes gleaming with madness. It's the same soft pink and purple you recognize from the multi-legged Riki that live in this area, and my pet. Oh, there it is. But so much larger. Could this be a related species? Its gaze drops from you to your pet Riki, Riki Tiki, who chitters and runs up to it, waving its grasping tentacles. The gigantic creature huffs and leans down to sniff it, its rage forgotten. Interesting. Sing to it. Interesting. Fight it. Watch it. Let the creature sniff your pet. 
Uh, hi. We do not allow promotional messages. Thank you. Let the creature sniff. The larger creature makes a chuffing noise like a tiger, a bassy, vibrating exhale that ruffles your Vriki's fur. Content, it's not going. Content, it's not going to eat Ricky Tiki. You keep back and let them introduce themselves. Ricky Tiki isn't intimidated in the slightest. In fact, it seems totally relaxed in the presence of this hulking beast. They touch tentacles and sniff each other, and your Vriki even curls up in the bigger one's arms for a while. Wait, they look just like parent and child. Is this another life phrase of the Vriki? After a while, this huge Riki leaves harmlessly. You're happy your little buddy got some social time with their own species. Okay, cool. Minus 30 stress, that's huge. Uh, sure, let's go talk to another Riki. You come across not just one Riki, but a whole swarm of them. Mostly just baby ones, about the size of your head. They're all amassed around a massive tree, scurrying up and down the trunk. When you can see the tree itself under the swarm, you notice it's the same pale pink as the baby Vriki. Its tentacle-like roots meander a fairly large distance before plunging into the ground. When the Vriki see you approach, they get agitated, and they look hungry. Definitely hungry, like dozens of hungry grapefruit-sized furry pink spiders, the stuff of nightmares. Your pet, Ricky Tiki, doesn't seem scared at all. I don't know. I think I'm uh I think I'm riled up a little bit here. I have Kudus of total equals goal, excellent. I'm better at those than trying to max out my points. Let's do the cards with gems, which I don't have any of. Just a moment of things. Might just do a series of twos, get that those high numbers. Alright, so now we just need 19, we already have two, so we just need a few more points here. That gets me to 16, and then I think if I just throw a three over here, yes, perfect. Extra kudos. Well, that wasn't so hard. You smack a couple of them to the ground, and the rest scuttle up to bows and hide there. You puff your chest out bravely and walk on. You find a healthy blet bush and harvest some of the leaves to bring back to the colony. Utopia is beyond excited when she sees your haul. Oh, bleb, she cries, shoving her hands right into the basket of rustling leaves. Selene, you're a boy after my own heart. She pops a leaf in her mouth and chews on it, then shudders happily. Woo, she cries. That'll perk you up, but good. And Anne brews a heck of a cup of this stuff, but me? I prefer it raw. She points at you. Don't you go getting any funny ideas. This will turn you green and give you spots. Cross my heart. Stay away until you're older. Ha ha ha. Potent brew. Chew some blep leaves. Uh, just because Utopia was born on Earth, she thinks she's an adult just like the rest of them. She's closer to your age than to all of the other adults. What does she know, anyway? You wait until Utopia leaves, then shove a leaf in your mouth. Ugh! You struggle to not spit it out right away. It's so bitter! You can't help but stick out your tongue. Blep, indeed. Mysteriously, you experience a rush of giddiness a few minutes later. Whew! Wow! That blep sure is good! No wonder adults keep this stuff away from kids. It's probably addictive. Wah wah! Still more negative distress. I might be able to clear out all the encounters on this expedition. Oh, another one of these freakies. A curious freaky blocks your path. It's acting strange. It keeps scurrying up trees and hanging upside down to get a different angle to look at you, then dropping down when you try to pass underneath. It may be small, but it's at least attempting to be intimidating. That must mean something. It's not interested in your pet freaky, it's interested in you. Even Ricky Tiki looks unsure and hides between your legs. Well, let's approach it and find out what's up. Start. Six gems. No. Just get the pair, probably. Get three of the kind. Throw five in there. 
need 28 now. This might be tough. Plus two for each gem and other cards. Plus one for each gem and other cards. And we have a gem. Plus I can do that. Plus one for each gem and other cards. This would be bad, but yeah. So now let's see if we can get any better runs. Now that kind of needs to stay there. Yeah, the fact that that becomes a three makes straights very hard to get here. Huh. This one without a little help here could push through for that stress. I mean, I have gotten a lot of stress back, so it wouldn't be the end of the world. But I do also have a number of these. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of these, so I might just use that to bump up some numbers. The question is, what will be the best, what will be the most efficient way to do that? Because I could just add six points to something, maybe to this one. Um, but I wonder if there is a way to get, use it to get a, a pair or a straight. And I think probably two on this one, right? Do one of that and do one of that. Oh, right, okay, sure. That gets me to 27. Pain in the butt. That's too bad. Yeah, at this point, I think we just throw another one on there, take the win, and move on. The Vriki runs up your leg. It's a giant spider thing, and it's got weird tentacles, and ah, ah, get it off! The urge to dance around and shake it off is almost uncontrollable, but you manage to keep your cool. The Vriki tastes you with its tentacle, feel, tentacle feel, feeler legs, but doesn't look interested in causing you harm. It pokes at your backpack trying to get in, then gives up and scurries off. Hmm. Uh, so this, is, I think, is sort of back towards the start, so I think maybe let's go... See what's up with that manticore. Because that's a smart, safe idea, right? Yeah, let's do that. The Valley of Vertigo spans a huge and relatively safe area, so it's rare to see other foragers out here. It's surprising, then, to come across Utopia and two other foragers crouching in the underbrush. Psst, Selene! Utopia hisses, beckoning you over. Get over here! You slink over to the other foragers. Through a gap in the underbrush, you spot a terrific sight. A fully grown manticore has fallen into a nest of at least twenty snap bladders, and they're engaged in what looks like a battle to the death. I've got ten kudos on the snap bladders, she says. I fell into I fell into a nest once. I was laid up in the med bay for a week. Poor Manticore, the, one of the other foragers says. What a way to go, the last forager snorts. Those snap bladders don't have a chance. I'll take ten on the Manticore. The Manticore roars in pain as it's torn apart by the whip-fast, hungry snap bladders. I can bet, or I can help the Manticore, I guess. So, let's see what happens. Card becomes three, always. Always becomes a bit of a challenge. Let's get rid of that early. Of course, I can't get the backwards straight, which is too bad. All cards under three become three. Set damage to this value. So if I did something like that and that, that's going to be a three anyway. And I think that becomes a three. Sure. And then saves my big cards for the last round here. Right. Card to the right becomes a three. That doesn't actually help. That doesn't help. That becomes a three. So we don't want to put anything higher than a three on there. And I don't want to use 
that, so I guess we can just do something like this. And, well, hold on. I'm not going to get a street with those two, so we'll pair those up. Then I can bring this over, still get that, uh, that flush pair. I guess there's only one extra card, or one extra point. Um, what if I, that's a 30, if I swap these, this will lower my points, but give me three threes in a row. Is that better? It is better. See, I'm learning. Slowly. The Manticore is adorable, Sai. Uh, that's, that's one, that's one word for what the Manticore is, I guess. <laughs> also, hello and welcome. Sai is our... Communications manager at uh, Silver String. So thanks for coming and hanging out. <laughs> yes, look at that cute smile. Sure, 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 sure. Hey, I did get the highest score. Awesome. Yes, cute. That's definitely uh, not the word I was going to use. Utopia tries to stop you as you burst through the underbrush, dedicating yourself to being the best distraction your weak, fragile human body can be. Enough of the snap bladders turn their focus on you that the manticore is easily able to pick the others off. Crunch, munch, snap! Off go enough heads in the manticore's powerful jaws that the survivors cut their losses, disappearing back into their burrow. If not friend, why friend-shaped? Again, your your definition of friend-shaped is um, an intriguing one, Sai. Now you find yourself face to face with the manticore, Vertumna's perfect murder machine. It looks at you quizzically. You look back. You feel a weird connection to this creature. Suddenly, Manticore roars, lunging at you and lashing its great mane. Wisely, you scream in terror and get the hell away. Luckily, the Manticore is too wounded to bother chasing you. You and the other foragers make it away without injury. Keep exploring. Might as well. Oops. Vriki are carnivores, you think, but the juveniles are too small to take out anything larger than an insect. Not so much the case with this one. The freaky blocking your path is pretty large, probably about as tall as your waist, and it's growling at you over the carcass of something even bigger, which seems to be missing its head. Yuck. You're not sure if it killed or scavenged the dead animal, but it's dragged it onto the path and looks ready to fight you for it. Uh, I am going to fight it, because maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe they're good eaten too. Desperate times, as they say. Let's do something like that. Which one of these will happen? It'll be minus three, but then yeah, plus two for that. So N becomes red, so another plus one. That's good use of that. You've been bitten by a lion. That's quite the claim to fame, Sai. That's uh that's something. I've cuddled with a baby cheetah. That was that was fun, but it was very small. Plus ten. That's not right. Oh, no, that was a weird bug. Anyway, so for each gem, one of the cards. And then I can get a three. And if then I can get a two. That's a pretty good straight. <laughs> the lion was also a baby and very small. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Fun story then. Might be it now, because that's gonna just negative those fours. So if I do something like this, that'll give me a run there, an extra straight, and then just seven extra points at the end there. I like that. Hey! Another win. Uh, you chase the Riki off and claim ownership of the dead animal. It's no prize. It's completely rotten. It's not even worth calling it a retrieval team. Calling a retri in a retrieval team. What a waste. Ah, damn. Alas. An absolutely enormous tree forms part of the path here. Its roots cut natural stairs into the path, and its magnificent canopy of large flat leaves completely blocks out the sky. They arch overhead almost to the ground on the other side. Walking under it is like going through a tunnel. 
In the tunnel is dark and gloomy, unseasonably cool, and filled with the whispering of leaves. You get the sense that something is aware of your presence. Interesting. Whisper back? Climb up it? I'll make you the bravery thing here. I've been doing a lot of the animal stuff, but it could be cool to climb up and see what happens. You climb up and onto one of the big flat leaves, surprised that they can actually support your weight. Neat. You get high enough out of the fog to see the whole area. It's very pretty, but nothing else happens. It's too bad I didn't really need that perception, but oh well. How are we doing here? Ooh, an egg. Gonna take it. You come out of the trees into a large grassy clearing. In the middle is a, well, you can only describe it as a pedestal. In the middle of a cradle of flowers, it's a massive egg, easily larger than any egg you've seen before. It's white with red flecks, and it's just sitting there in the middle of the empty clearing, totally unprotected. Uh, yeah, I feel like the smart thing would be to leave it, but I uh, gotta get that food. You put one foot up on the pedestal to brace yourself. This thing is huge. However, as you do, the pedestal starts moving, and it starts growling. Its flowering appendages unfurl to reveal the face of a manticore. Oof a doof. It narrows its feline eyes at you and rumbles in warning as it stands to its full terrifying height. You figured out where the egg came from. With your arms full of egg, you can't really fight. Your choices are limited. Throw the egg and run. Keep the egg and run. Fight the manticore. An impossible combat challenge. Well, yeah, okay. If it's gonna just tell me that straight up. Uh, normal difficulty. Uh, really would like the challenge. I think that would be fun. But uh, I think if it says, if it's telling me it's impossible, do I try it? I guess I can still, if I fight, keep the egg and run. No, you know what? I'm going to go for it. Let's see what happens. Even if you lose these things, sometimes interesting things happen. And I'm feeling rowdy at age 14. This planet is making it very hard for us to live here, and maybe we can do something about that. Yeah, but not with cards this low, huh? It's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough one. Uh, this will require the extra stress if I have any hope. But I think I may not have any hope. Yeah, nowhere near. And I can't even push through. Uh, let's give up and see what happens. I don't... Uh, <laughs> Manticore rights. <laughs> Sorry, Sai. Uh, I don't know that I've, like actually ever chosen to give up on one of these challenges i'm usually able to to get through even if i have to use some items to get there uh but the game tells you that interesting th interesting things can happen if you fail a, a story-based challenge uh so i guess let's find out what those interesting things might be as this manticore attempts to murder me You just can't manage it. The egg is too cumbersome. You can't even see your own feet. You stumble and fall to the dirt, and the manticore's shadow blocks out the sun. You hear a sharp whistle. The manticore jerks backwards with a growl. You're too addled from the fall for your eyes to focus properly, but a tall someone strides out of the forest as you sit in shock. They carefully take the egg from you and return it to the nest. Ah, fun. Mysterious stranger shows up again. The beast is mollified. It checks the egg over and over, occasionally glaring at you. Just as you're starting to shake the fog from your head and form a question, you realize the figure is gone. <laughs> Death is interesting. Yes, exactly, Sai. Well, I survived, thanks to a mysterious stranger. If barely. If, uh, stepped a little far within my hubris, but, you know... Gotta take some risks, I think. I should head home soon, but I can think I could do one more encounter if there is one more encounter to do here. Now I'm walking around in circles. There's some. There's also some. Cool. Also, the background just changed slightly as my trees 
grow lights turned off, but we have lights on the tree now for December, so still got some nice lighting in here. Something about the ground here draws your attention. It's oddly lumpy. What's up with that? Yeah, we'll scope it out. Not that I need the perception points, but that means it'll be definitely doable. Well, that affected it will affect it that's cool so that gives me that probably won't be able to get the highest number if I don't want to use that which I mean actually to be fair I'm gonna max out stress anyway so let's try it then the question will just be, does that get me more, 39, or does that get me more, 39. Okay, well, and of course it's still not the highest I can get. Whoa, it's a Watato minefield. Underground, the recent rain has swelled the young melons to bursting. You better watch where you step or you'll end up knee-deep in Watato juice. The good news is, they're tasty. Oh, I guess I could en enjoy a break and maybe get some of that stress back, but nope, we're gonna forage. Get the food, get the food. They're so dang heavy, the calorie to weight ratio isn't optimal. Most are too young, but you find a ripe one, dig it up, and roll it back to the depot. If you're too worn out and tired to continue, you have to go home now, which I will. You're surprised when you wake up this morning and your mom and dad are both still in your quarters. Usually they're long gone before sunrise. You pull back the curtain and they look over at you with big smiles. Sulane, your mom says, cradling a mug of blep tea in her hands as your dad rubs her feet. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Someone didn't hear the good news, your mom replies cheekily. We're announcing it later today, but guess what, kiddo? I think we're going to be okay. Wow. Okay, so, so we got told that the famine was going to be a problem. I go out exploring once and I find enough food myself to stop the famine from being an issue okay well good for me i guess she chuckles at your sleepy confused look the famine she explains we still need to do the work but we pulled out of it we got out of the spiral we're going to be okay between farming and foraging we've secured enough food to make it through until harvest next year just until next year your mom shrugs it's better than this year We'll have to take stock again, but what we manage to do should keep paying off and won't take as much work next year. Especially with that sponge cake, eh? Your dad sighs happily. I'm already looking forward to dinner. I haven't really cooked in ages. What should we have, Selene? Sponge bread curry, trippet steak. Mom should choose. Can we go straight to dessert? Uh, trippet steak. I harvested those, those arms despite the sad pleading of the trippet itself, so uh, let's lean in. The premise of all teen stories as adults are useless. Definitely the premise of, well, most of them. Trippet steak. Are they plant or meat? You're still not sure. Eating meat is still pretty weird after a lifetime of being vegan, but it's so delicious. You and your parents cook a private meal in your kitchenette. Your dad does most of the work, but you help. When you sit down for a quiet family dinner, you realize this is the first time you've done this in... I can't even remember how long. You talk about your day in the most mundane way possible so pleasantly normal ended starving you don't even get close to clearing your plate since your body isn't used to so much food but that's okay you eat slowly and savor it every bite is heaven and made even better by knowing that you had a real impact on the colony's future wow yeah that was uh that was an impressive one month harvest that sponge cake definitely uh definitely helped i suppose so, that's, uh, yeah, that changes things. I think, you know, but I think what it's told me, uh, at least for this playthrough, what it's told my, my Solane here is that uh, it's worth doing whatever it takes for us to survive. Went out there and made some questionable choices, perhaps, but it paid off. Everyone's going to be okay. And that is a perhaps bad lesson that I'm going to take away from from this little famine incident. Setting up some, some narrative here. 
Uh, it is the end of pollen, and I think that's somebody's birthday. But I can never remember when I start a new... Ah, oh, it is, of course. It's Tammy's birthday. Tammy, Tammy, Tammy. Hello, Tammy. Tammy is sitting very quietly, her knitting forgotten in her lap. One of her ears twitches as you approach, and she winces and shakes her head. I keep getting the feeling that someone is coming, like they're looking for me, she says, rubbing her ear. I must be hearing things. Oh, that's uh, unfortunate. Present for Tammy. Tammy loves, well, actually, I'm going to save the cake, because I know um, Cal loves cake even more. I think Tammy will also love this yellow flower, because she likes yellow. Flowers on my birthday. How beautiful. She gives you a gigantic hug. Wonderful. Uh, and now it's time to take time off again. So I think I will do so in the garden once more. Relax in the park. Your mom is tending to her garden as you relax nearby. You're both happy to leave each other alone, but you can hear her muttering to herself as she pulls weeds. Every day, she grumbles. You'd think I was never here at all with how some of these weeds grow. I thought that bringing only nice plants would mean we wouldn't have to weed as much, but these vertumnin plants, they're unstoppable. She pulls hard on one weed, which turns out to be a huge creeping vine that yanks out a few flowers. Arr! Just, I just want one place on this planet that's ours. It's home of Earth. No, help it. You get down there and help your mom pull weeds for the better part of the afternoon. It's surprisingly hard work. By the end, your back and shoulders are aching and the palms of your hands are on fire. Well, it's for resting, I guess. Your mom dumps a huge armful of weeds into a wheelbarrow. These go all the way to the edge of the colony, she says warily. Whatever plant these roots belong to, they're invading my garden. It sounds like mint. I'm trying to garden mint. Garden mint? Grow mint? Yeah, that would be better, Lucas. She turns towards the walls and yells, You stupid pink bastards! Stay out there where you belong! Ooh, I can forget some delusions. Well, I've leaned hard into them, so I have several, so I think uh, clearing out my deck a little bit would be nice. Early dust. Famine is over. We're all rested. Someone has a birthday. Late dust wet early dust i thought it was an enemy and i missed anemone's birthday last year and i want to be friends with an anemone so definitely want to make sure we don't miss it nem grabs you by the shoulders selene you gotta help me she says urgently mom keeps talking about how we're all gonna have to start having babies and she gets this look about her i don't want to have any scungy babies nem shudders with her whole body why did i gotta be in a girl body anyway i'm tougher and stronger than lots of boys and no one's telling them they gotta have babies red egg for Anemone. Cool, thanks, she says, taking the egg. I guess it is my birthday this week. I kind of forgot. <laughs> Mood Nem, yes. Yeah, fair, fair, sigh, fair. Uh, all right, well, my big plan for this year was to spend a bunch of it foraging in order to solve the, or try to solve the, uh, the famine, and I did that with one foraging trip. So I sort of, oops, don't want to miss that. So I sort of have... A few months to do whatever I want to do, I guess. Do some more combat, maybe. Defense training. But again, I know there's going to be a, a lot more of that coming up shortly, actually. Bravery is already pretty high, and that'll keep going up if I do more exploration. These ones are low. Engineering might be good to get up, actually. Though I think I still I have unlocked engineering. Yeah, let me do some engineering then. Since I finally have reasoning a whole five. Let's register for engineering classes. Using Congruence's HoloNet scheduling system is almost a test on its own. You feel like a hacker navigating the confusing interface, but manage to add your name to the list of drop-in students. Cool. You're now eligible to join Tangent and some of the older students in engineering class. Great. Um, and yeah, I think that is what uh, what I want to do now that the famine is uh, somewhat dealt with. Get that uh, engineering points up. Professor Hal rubs his hands together as he waits for the class to settle down. He's in a great mood. This must be his favorite subject to teach. If biology and chemistry are the wet sciences, then engineering must be a dry one. But believe me, this class definitely won't be dry. He winks. It's weird. We'll also be learning math, physics, computing, robotics, architecture, and astronomy. Tangent raises her hand. Will we also learn about nuclear engineering, she asks. 
Professor Hal nods. Yes, at a beginner level. We'll have an overview of atomic theory and take a field trip to the engine rooms to learn how our ship's nuclear reactor works to power the colony. Cool. This one for each unplayed card is the locked one. Well, oh well. Uh, all I gotta do is get a 21. Let's put that in to get some extra skills. And then it's just as many points as I can get. And that will be either 22 or 23 for the flush. Uh, is that the most points that I can get? Who the heck knows? Oh, it is! Wonderful. Four engineering, two reasoning. Wonderful. Good things to start uh, putting some time into. I think I'll keep doing that for a bit this year. It's time for Vertumnalia, the yearly midsummer celebration when the colony gives thanks for its good fortune. This year, you have a lot to be thankful for. As you file into the main square, you see the feast table laden with the literal fruits of your labors. Great big piles of foraged food compete for table space with tureens overflowing with potatoes and corn, all steaming and gorgeous in the high dust sunlight. It was a lot of hard work, but you can be proud. You, you did this. You helped. Governor Uticott still recovering from the effects of rationing, her body quaking as she takes her place on stage. My, what a year it's been, she chuckles, her voice dry and thin, even through the maxiphoner. I'm so proud to stand before you today on feast day to enjoy the results of our hard work. This year, more than any other year, we celebrate our resolve as a community. She spreads her thin arms in welcome. Let us enjoy our blessings together. The colony applauds and Uticott bows her head and thanks. Everyone clears away the chairs for the annual competition. Which one do you participate in this year? Once more, the only one I can. The bot, now Pentathlon. I like how it gets more and more complicated every year. You, Cal, and Nem wait excitedly to know what Calm's going to add this year. Climbing, swimming, calisthenics. Calm smiles at you as he explains that the addition this year will be... Thumb wrestling. Last 30 seconds against Calm or get a time penalty. Lol. Oh well. Anytime I can hang out with Calm. Nem's face falls. No fair, she exclaims. Calm's the shipwide thumb wrestling champion. He talks about it all the time. He's the worst. Calm just shrugs and blows his whistle for you to get into position. Let's do it. Okay. This one for that. I've got a couple of things for things with gems and a couple of gems. Pretty high goal, but I might save these to work with each other even more. Do I dare just do two cards here? Maybe I will. That'll be a bit of a challenge for me. Alright, well, we're gonna have to do it now. So let's do that. Let's do that. That and that, perhaps? Yeah, I think that's probably pretty good. I only need a 26 now. Boom, boom, boom. Good, good, good. Do I want a four? That's three fours in a row. Wonderful. I think that's pretty good. Hey, got another best score. I guess I've been getting uh, better at that. You don't beat Kam at the thumb wrestle. Nobody can. He's the best. But you do manage to hold on through 30 tenths seconds of maneuvering and fake-outs and double fake-outs. The man is a master. In fact, the things you learn from Kam in those 30 seconds can be applied to the bot you have to wrestle at the end of the contest. You wonder how you never noticed before how much of bot wrestling is finesse, not just brawn. You win handily. Nem whines at Kam for being unfair, but she still takes second place. After the festivities, the whole colony takes a few days off for a break. Nam and Kam organize a giant sports ball tournament, and Anne sets up a foot a, a food stall. No, not a foot stall. Sets up a food stall serving sweet potato juice slushies and spiral cut potatoes on skewers. The party just keeps going. It's great. Mid dust. All right. So still feeling pretty good about where I'm at. Saving combat for later, done enough exploring for the year, probably. Yeah, I think just continuing to sink a bit of time into some reasoning and engineering uh, will be nice. 
To further your engineering knowledge, you're taking a mini class with Chief Engineer Instance on the construction and maintenance of your hollow palms. These devices are engineered bismuth crystals embedded into your palms when you start, start school. They use the heat and electric current of the human body to power themselves, to talk to each other, and connect to the holonet, Congruence's massive repository of information. You can barely remember life before yours. Hollow palms were commonplace by the time the Vertumna group first formed on Earth, and the square bismuth has grown in the lab, Instance explains. So the physical device itself isn't hard to maintain. The difficulty is in the display and touch interface. Instance opens her hollow palm, displaying a visible projected screen floating above her palm. As chief engineer, she also has one of the fancier versions that combines with a pair of eyeglasses to superimpose a projection right onto what she sees. The interface relies on plasma voxel generators, which require extremely small components that are impossible to nanoprint. The material will have to be mined from Vertumna itself. Tang raises her hand. Is it possible to hack these devices, she asks? If the biological slash electronic interface is so thin, is it possible to hack the human body? In a way, we've already begun to hack the human body, Instance replies. What do you call Gentech? Everything the body does and is capable of depends on four nucleobases in different configurations, and it's no different than congruence. Human and artificial intelligences are both built from a limited code, and are transformed into more by the building. Your genetic enhancements, superhearing and sight, temperature regulation, increased resistance to fear, disease, and fatigue, all present in the human genome and unlocked by the power of science. The class splits into working groups to explore installing modules onto your hollow palm. You and Tangent are in a group together. She begins installing a mod that will let her scan inorganic materials and get a reading of their chemical compositions. What do you do? Uh, can't, still not enough engineering. I just started to download my own mod. Try to remove my hollow palm. That seems like a bad idea. I think I'll just learn from Tangent. You don't feel comfortable modding your own hollow palm yet, so you just sit and watch Tang as she upgrades hers. She's hesitant at first, but relaxes after she realizes that you're not here to judge her. You learn a lot from her. She can be nice, so long as you don't ask too many dumb questions and you're doing something she likes. That's not a bad one to have locked, at least. But I can turn in all, become blue, get a ton of good words. Uh, flush bonuses. Seems pretty good. Heck yeah. Lots more engineering and reasoning. Wonderful. Some kudos. All good stuff. Late dust. This is somebody's birthday. I think it's Cal. Yes. We've saved a cake just for him. Hey, Cal. You spot Cal kneeling in the dirt, digging up root vegetables and frowning. They're so small this year, he says, holding one up and examining it. Maybe there's just not enough nutrients in the soil. Is that something we're doing wrong? Uh, I will have to come back to do that, but I want to make sure I don't forget his birthday, so here is some cake. Cal gasps, my favorite food, and on my birthday, too! He makes grabby hands at the cake and takes a big huff of the pleasant, sugary smell as his eyes slip closed in sheer pleasure. Wow, Selene, he breathes. You are really the best of the best. Here, you have a piece, too. Let the icing melt in your mouth and let all your worries melt away with it. Very good. Want to hear a fun nature fact? You tell him about the time Tang brought a skunk bug for show and tell in biology, and it got scared and made the worst, most smelliest, grossest stink you have ever smelled, and everyone thought Tang had farted. Then Professor Hal had to clear out the whole room, and it took weeks to get the smell out of the beanbags, and it was so gross. But also kind of neat how such a tiny bug could make a whole room of kids run away. Cal laughs. I remember that, Selene, except the way I heard it, it wasn't Tang, it was you! Oops. Anything from anyone else? No, not really. So my friendships generally. Yeah, okay, already pretty high with Anemone. So those are gonna go pretty well. Tang's pretty low, or tension, yeah, Tang, Tang's pretty low. Um, but I'm doing a little more schooling this year, so I probably don't need to worry too much about that. We'll see what happens in, uh, in future years. Lots of time to, to ply people with gifts, I think. Some more engineering. Oh, you know, see a notice on the engineering hollow web. Professor Hal is looking for someone to help with after-school tutoring. You should know the basics and be a quick study for the rest. Please apply. Well, I do not know the basics, so we'll have to apply to that later. You can't very well teach others until you learn the material yourself. 
Ooh, lots of high numbers here. Plus two to, oh, plus two to cards with gems. So that will become an eight. Mm, and that will be a six. That gets me a good, a good, good straight. Yes, I am getting better at this. I'm so proud of myself. Into early wet. It's interesting how sometimes with, uh, depending on what you're doing in a given, in a given year, you can get through a number of months pretty quick. Because I think once more, I'm going to do a birthday, because it's, it is Mars, haha. And just keep on studying for a bit. Maybe I should do one, one round of the depot, see if anything fun's happening in there. Uh, do you go to engineering much, Mars asks? I tried to go talk to Tangent because she never wants to just hang out anymore, not since she got started working on that big project. Mars snaps her gum. You know about that, right? Or am I just special? I don't think I know about that yet. But here, have a flower. Well, I've had better birthday gifts, Mars sighs, rubbing at one of the petals, but this will look nice in my hair, I think. Thank you. Today is... <laughs> Mars scowls over her homework. Today is biology, she says. This is so dumb. There's only one kind of biology I care about, and I don't cover it in school. All right, Mars. Tell her about your day. Mars is always talking about how she's bored and wishes there was more to do here. But there are a hundred reasons for Tumina isn't boring. We try to list them all. There's all the cool plants and new constellations to look at. And just yesterday, you watched a Dorbs moth squeeze through a crack in the wall no animal should be able to fit through. <laughs> boring. Oh no, I hate that card. Mars listens politely, but starts yawning halfway through. Less bored is still bored when it comes to Mars and Vertumna. Maybe I can get rid of that card at some point. Uh, yeah, I think I will take one turn in the depot just to see if there's anything interesting happening this year. Look in the depot. Mars calls the meeting IS. They always get to check in on the secret fun times club. She declares it's time to put the secret part of the F SFC into effect. You're going to play spies. First of all, the adults know something about the attacks in Glow that they're not telling us, Mars asserts. There's a council meeting starting soon just down the hall. We're going to investigate. Nem crosses her arms. Uh-uh, not gonna do it, she says. I didn't sign up for, for any get in trouble club. It's insulting to think that the adults are hiding information from us, Tang points out. If there's something dangerous out there, we should all know. Tammy wrings her hands, worried at the very idea. Yeah, Cal agrees. If something is making the animals attack us, maybe we can help figure it out. That way, we don't have to hurt the animals. Tang rolls her eyes. Spying is wrong. I don't want to get in trouble. Let's be a spy. Rebels! Mars nods. Okay, whoever wants to come, follow me and stay quiet. You, Tang, and Cal join her. You, Tal, you, Tang, Cal, and Mars creep down the hall toward the council room. It's still empty. Good. Mars pulls a small crystal object out of her pocket and shows it to you. It sort of resembles your hollow palm. She whispers, It's a 3D camera, like the kind they use to record holovids. So Lane is going to hide in the council room. <laughs> Why me? It's sweet time to use my ninja skills. <laughs> Just make sure nobody sees you, Mars says, and drops the crystal into your palm. Mars nudges you forward. Then the three of them giggle and scurry back to the club room. You're on your own. I pretend to be cleaning. I like that organizing 20. You grab a static mop from a panel in the wall and vigorously wipe the floors as you enter the empty council room. You work your way over to a potted antler fern and drop the crystal into the pot while pretending to dust it. Success! You casually make your way back out of the room and rejoin the others. Mars beams at you. Good work, Selene. Now. Oh, shh, it's starting. The four of you watch the feed on your hollow palm as the council members enter the room. They start with some formalities, not all that different from how Mars starts your club meetings. Eddie Seedens gives the first report on domestic matters. We've almost finished construction on the next phase of the living area, she says. Other than that, we're doing well. Instance gives the report from engineering. We've researched the electrical bugs the children discovered had been chewing through the wiring, she says, impassively. Even in great numbers, they provide far too little energy to make them a viable alternative energy source. However, power efficiency is up across the board due to our efforts at exterminating them. Oh, hi, Ruby. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, we're we're doing some spoilers this run, so so no worries if you uh, don't want to stay around and get too spoiled. It's definitely worth uh, it's definitely worth 
playing yourself uh, for sure. Uh, there's some really amazing stuff in this game, so I don't want to don't want to ruin the experience for you. But I, I do really appreciate you uh, you stopping by and, and saying hello. Uh, good to good to see you. <laughs> Cheers. Your mom clears her throat. We have managed to forage and hunt enough food to fill our larders until we can get plants in the ground again, she says. But the fact of the matter is, we're still pulling less out of the ground than we're putting in. We're going to keep having this problem unless we can manage to fully integrate native plants into our agriculture. Utica gives your mother her full endorsement. Rhett gives the report from the defense. We're working on a strategy for dealing with the next Xeno attack. Utopia cuts in. On that note, there's still the matter of our scanners picking up that broadcast, but only in glow season, she says, standing up and putting her hands on the table. It has to be connected to the attack somehow. We should investigate. Now. Utica shakes her head. We need everyone near the colony during glow. It's dangerous to go recklessly off into the wilderness when the animals are so agitated. I won't be responsible for endangering more colonists, Utica continues. If something is out there during glow, I want to try to investigate it when things are more calm. Utopia slams her fist against the table. If we don't investigate soon, we'll all be in danger, she shouts. We can't keep living like this. Rhett also stands up and points his finger at Utopia. I'll be the one responsible for telling the family of your explorer that they didn't make it back, not you. So I'll thank you not to make decisions regarding the security of the colony. The rest of the council erupts into raised voices and angry adults. Mars turns off the stream audio, leaving them to continue arguing silently as you all stare quietly at each other. I knew it was bad about the food, but not that bad, Mars says. Why are they only arguing about what to do about the attacks? I don't want to starve. She makes a noise of frustration. Ah, Utica is way out of touch with what really matters. She's she's like a crone, and everyone else is just her cronies. Tang solemnly records your findings in the club's secret ledger while everyone else exchanged worried looks. You're not so sure you are happy to you heard any of this. Oof. I haven't had that encounter before. It was good. Ah, speaking of stress. Well. Realistically, that's going to be the highest I can get. Probably. Well, value is wild means it's good for... Four, three, five. Damn it. Is it worth the one kudos? Kudos to have two kudos, I guess. Probably not. Oh, well, 35 wouldn't have even done it, so there you go. Mid wet. Alrighty. Still not a lot going on now, so I'll just go back to school. I didn't do a lot of school early on, so... Professor Hal is a first-class nerd. You can almost always ask him a question that makes him spiral off into a long explanation, going into way more detail than you'd ever need to know. It's a useful skill for those days when you don't feel like doing schoolwork. <laughs> well, everything becomes blue if I do that. Something like that, if I don't want the extra stress, wins anyway. Alright, well now it is Tang and Dis's birthday. Tang looks up from her work, holding her stomach as it rumbles audibly. What, again? Who cursed me with a mortal form? I did not ask for this. She reaches into her bag and pulls out a protein bar. The downside to requiring less sleep is that the body burns more calories while awake, she says, taking a bite. My caloric intake is much higher, similar to that of a bodybuilder, which is fitting, as I do have the strongest brain in the colony. All right, Tang. Have some herbs. Or roots, rather. It seems you've remembered my birthday, Tang says, taking the roots and turning them over in her hands. Her lip curls in distaste at the dirt still that still cling to them. How thoughtful of you. I have much to do today, but I'll set these roots aside to analyze later. She turns to walk away, then remembers herself. Thank you, she adds, almost as an afterthought. Oh, and a new little story event with her now. Tangent looks up from her hollow palm, blinking as her eyes refocus on the middle distance, and then on you. Her previously long hair is gone, buzzed close to her scalp. You almost didn't recognize her when you first saw her. You wonder if it was caused by a lab accident or something. Hello, Selene, she says, already KG. Did you need something? 
hair. I mean, what's up with your hair? No, I just came by to say hello. The faintest hint of relief passes across Tang's face. You get the impression that not pressing her on her personal appearance was a wise choice. Oh, well, hello then, Tang replies. She raises her hand as if to push her hair out of her face, but stops when she realizes what she's doing. I'm rather busy at the moment, actually, so if you don't mind, you can take a hint. All right. Where's this? There he is. I've been learning a lot about systems, just says Ray on his hollow palm. Like the water cycle and the nitrogen cycle, and food webs and decomposition, stuff like that. It's pretty cool, even if it's all textbooks from Earth. He looks wistfully out in the wilderness. So much we don't know about this place. You also like some leaves. For, for my birthday, he mumbles. Oh, thank you. This looks like it's from a very rare plant. Did you find it while you were exploring? Month before glow. Stress is halfway up, that's all fine. Let's just do one more round of schooling. You should have known better, Tangent, you hear as you walk past the laboratory. Curious, you listen at the door. Chief Engineer Instant sighs. I know you meant well, but your presumption has cost us three months of work. You can't simply look at an experiment and change the parameters to your liking. Getting results is not the same as doing good science. Your findings, however scientifically interesting, are useless to us without sound metho methodological underpinnings. Tang's response is more subdued than you've ever heard her before. I'm sorry, Chief Engineer, she mumbles, looking down the floor. I recognize the error of my ways. I should hope so, Instance replies, pinching the bridge of her nose and her fingers. I'll expect you in the lab first thing tomorrow morning, and I will personally supervise your work in resetting the experiment. You flatten it against the wall as an instance breezes past you, barely giving you a second look as she strides down the hallway. You poke your head inside the laboratory where Tang scowls and wipes her eyes. What do you want? Cheer up, it could be worse. I don't think that's going to be a, a, a good thing to say to Tang, sadly. It'd be better the second time around. I just don't have enough reasoning for that. Just ask her what she was working on. Tang sighs and rubs her eyes harder. Something I've been working on with Chief Engineer Instance, she replies. I'm not supposed to talk about it, and I don't want to talk about it. Losing the data was my fault, Tang continues. I wanted to prove I'm not the little kid from biology class, that I'm ready to work hard and really make us great discoveries. Dr. Instance has always been there for me. When I was a kid, and now with my mother gone, she's the only adult in this colony who sees what I could become, she says. She believes that I can be better than what I am. It's always been that way. I just really want to impress her. You will. Hmm. Tang hums in agreement. I certainly hope so. Oh, I need to get rid of this card. Hmm. Something like that. Four, oh no, because that gives a six, so I still missed the straight. Oh, and that doesn't even get me close. All right, well, I guess. I'm gonna have to take the stress. <clears throat> is glow. Oh, it's so pretty. The challenges are coming. So, given that we're at glow in, in year five here, and I think I know what might be coming, uh, I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, Tang's comment about a, a growling tummy reminded me that I have a, a bit of one, so I'm just going to grab a little bit of chocolate and uh, some water. Uh, but I'll just be back in uh, a few minutes to continue into this glow season and into year six and some changes that are coming. So uh, thanks for coming by and watching so far. Um, if you missed the beginning, uh, I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm the studio director at Studio Silver String Media. We are a indie game studio focused on narrative games. Uh, we have a bunch of projects that you can check out, including Glitch Hikers, The Spaces Between, which we released this year. Uh, lots of info down in the uh, About section here on our new Twitch channel, and this is a new thing that we're trying out. So, uh, yeah, I'm having fun playing through Exocolonist, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite games, if not my favorite game of this year. 
Um, and I will be right back to continue that. So I'll be back in a couple. Thanks, everyone. Alrighty. Hello. I am back. Hope everyone is having a lovely afternoon slash evening. Uh, welcome back to the second half of the stream. We'll see how long I go today. Um, but yeah, hello. My name is Lucas. I'm the studio director at Slow String Media. We are an indie game company. We released a game earlier this year called Glitch Checkers The Spaces Between. And more importantly, we're streaming. Uh, I've been streaming... Uh, I was a teenage exocolonist for the last few weeks and continuing that here and we're looking forward to trying out some new stuff maybe do some uh some cool music streams and stuff like that bringing other members of the team in so 
yeah, we're trying out this Twitch thing and, and quite enjoying it so far. So thanks for, for coming by. Uh, if you haven't followed us yet, uh, we'd really appreciate the follow. Obviously, you get notifications when we go live and whatnot, but we can work our way towards that uh, Twitch affiliate status and get some custom emotes and all those fun community things if, uh, if we get going there. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for hanging out. We're going to jump back into the game in a sec here. Uh, we'll do a quick cat cam break. Very sleepy kitty. All wrapped up in his little bed. He likes being beside me. And so here we are. Uh, so let's get back into it. It is glow season of year five. And some shit's about to go down. Uh, that said... I guess I have one more month of things that I do before the shit does go down. And so, how do I want to spend that month? You know, it is glow season. Maybe just like hanging on the lounge would be nice. I don't need to relax necessarily, though. I could babysit during glow season. Empathy, creativity. Maybe it is best just to do some. Oh, you know what? Let's do some combat training. Let's get ready for glow season. Attendance at self-defense class is always a little higher during glow. It's almost as if the imminent threat of attack makes people worried for their lives. Yes, indeed. All right. Oh, so I got the new loyalty card. So it's it still does this, but it's a six in itself. Interesting. That won't be super high. First collectible use is free, so got to remember that. Something like this. Minus three to last card. I don't like that. One, two. Alright, so I can't even go using this one. Which I guess. Five, twenty. Okay, so twenty six is still. Better to use that, which is fine. And I can do a collectible use for free, so I'll just throw a mushwood log onto any of these high numbers. Uh, well, if I do the four, then that'll become a pair. And that gets me up to my best score. Plus five combat, nice. The roar wakes you. It would wake the dead. It shakes the walls, rumbles through the ship's hull, and makes your heart skip a beat. You're paralyzed by a sudden clench of fear in your gut. Through your porthole window, you hear metal screeching and people shouting. Then another roar, guttural and rumbling like the sound of a mountain collapsing. Something enormous is out there. Run out to face it. You don't know what gives you the courage, but you run out to the, to, to the fields to face the horrible creature, face to... F oh... It has no face. I just got chills and I've played this before. In place of a face, or even a head, its body just unzips, revealing a mess of writhing pink tentacles and blinking eyes pocked with jagged asymmetrical teeth. It stands on four enormously powerful legs, each as wide across as tree trunks. Clinging to its back and its thick slug-like tail are clumps of lichen that glow faintly in the night. The creature is nearly twice the height of a greenhouse. It stands on top of a flattened one, the wreckage of lattice and plants all around. Flickers of light from plas rifles and stun gloves light it from underneath, and the stench of ozone is thick in the air. You see Nem and her brother Calm darting in and around its legs with their twin shocks of red hair. The faceless creature lurches into another greenhouse, oblivious to the soldiers trying to herd it away. The monster left a trail of destruction from where it smashed right through the walls. Smaller creatures are pouring in through the gaps and heading towards. They're heading straight to command. You watch helplessly as the hordes of animals storm command, sneaking through torn away panels and smashing through windows. It's too far away to hear the screams, but Governor Uticott is inside. You have to do something. Ooh, fight the faceless monster on your own seems like a bad idea. I can save Governor Uticott, which if I don't, will 
be the end of Governor Uticott. Or I can help Nem and Calm. I'm leaning towards helping Nem and Calm in this run. I mean, I'm not going to, as much as I want to do a sort of combat-y, come-and-get-me world kind of thing, I think fighting the Faceless Monster on my own is a terrible idea. I've saved almost everyone this run through, and I think maybe uh, seeing some consequences would also be interesting, especially with what might come next. And I want to make sure that I help uh, my dear friend Nim. You run towards Geoponics, picking up a handful of rocks as you cross the barren fields. When Calm sees you, he gestures for you to flee. Get out of here, Selene, he says. You're going to get yourself killed. You grip the rocks in defiance. You're sick of being told to hide like a child. You want to help. Hard combat challenge, 68. Let's see how this goes. Card becomes a three. Oh, gosh. Well, it's not a great card to have right now. So I think we probably just do something like that to start with. That's two for each of the other cards. Um, maybe I save it. Maybe I do, oh, maybe I do something like that. That gets rid of that without actually losing anything. Round two and three will be tough, but yeah, so now I have more gems. Couple of gem cards. I don't have to do like that. And that is not bad. 31 to go. These are all good. Bonus to red challenges. And I can do this without needing any yellow cards. So I think something like oops, something like that. You try your hardest, but even with the full force of the defense squad, you can barely keep contained near the farms. You dart in and around the battle, throwing rocks and making noise to keep the abomination's attention away from the rest of the colony. Its tentacles whip around, slapping the ground, knocking into people, picking them up and throwing their helpless bodies like dolls, only to be crushed under its massive trunk-like feet. The fields are littered with bodies of the fallen. Sweat stings your eyes, but you somehow stay on your feet. Others aren't so lucky. Selene, watch out! Calm cries out, and you look up just in time to dodge the wet slap of a tentacle, tripping over a body and sprawling to the dirt yourself. The faceless makes a horrible noise from deep inside its craw, flecking you with spittle as your guts liquefy from the near miss. You're close enough to feel the sick heat radiating off of it. It doesn't have a face, but you realize with horror that it sees you. Zzzt! The beam of a plasma rifle arcs over your head, and the faceless roars again and turns its terrible attention to calm. You scream and uselessly cover your head as it lumbers over you. As you scramble to your feet, you see calm go flying through the air. He lands a few feet away with a sickeningly wet crunch. Nem cries in horror as she runs to calm's side, but it's too late. His body is bent at an unnatural angle, his eyes open, and his face frozen in stupefied terror. He looks unreal, like a wax mannequin. He's just gone like that. Nem lets out a primal scream of pain, and you can see the thought ignite in her mind, contorting her face with ugly fury as she stands up to launch herself at the Faceless again. You grab her arm, and she yells at you in wordless rage before collapsing to her knees, throwing her body over comms and sobbing like the scared teenager she is. You can only stand and watch. You hear a colossal cracking noise and look up to see the Faceless stumble towards the stratospheric. With a roar that shakes your very molecules, it loses its balance for the last time and falls onto the ship. Metal screams as the ship buckles and gives way. Whole pieces of the quarter's wing shear off as your home opens like a tin can, spilling its contents into the square. The strato lurches, then collapses under the creature's weight. The abomination is slain, but as wails of grief join the whimpers of the dying, you have to wonder, at what cost? The Council calls an all-colony meeting to face the aftermath of the attack. In the oppressive gloom of glow, you gather near engineering with the other survivors. 
it's one of the few buildings still standing. The corpse of the faceless still sits in the caved-in wreckage of the stratosphere, expelling its flaccid pink tentacles from its horrible zipper-toothed maw. It's already beginning to stink. Destruction of the strato. Your mind keeps replaying that terrible moment, the faceless rearing up and obscuring the sky, Nem and her brother looking so, so small before it. Governor Uticott was killed by the smaller creatures that swarmed command during the attack. In her absence, Seek addresses the colony. The Council acknowledges the bravery of the defense squad, citing their heroism and finally taking down the faceless. Geoponics is gone. The greenhouses destroyed and fields trampled. After a year of suffering, starving, and only barely scraping by, you're not just back to where you started. It's even worse. The entire front half of the stratospheric has been destroyed. The living quarters, the canteen, the garrison, the lounge, even the creche, it's all gone. It's only by some stroke of luck that people hiding in the creche weren't all killed. Seek solemnly reads the names of those who lost their lives, too many, including Governor Uticott. You all stand for a moment of silence. You feel the weight of loss like a blow to your chest. Nem and her family cry out when her brother Kam's name is called, and their quiet sobbing continues through the silence. Ooh, that got me. With the living quarters destroyed, everyone moves into the engineering wing for shelter. You're crowded into the classroom with other families. The adults try to make it seem like a sleepover, but you're all still so shaken. Tammy doesn't return to the classroom. The little ones got out okay, but she's still in med bay. It will be for a while. Nem cries about her brother and screams at anyone who tries to comfort her. Eventually, you just ignore her grief, as painful as it is to hear her sobbing at night. You feel like you've been awake for days, and you'll never fully sleep again. You try, but you keep jerking awake, crying out in fear. Eventually, you fall asleep sitting up, held in your far father's arms. Your sleep is fitful, but mercifully dreamless. This hit me pretty hard the first time I played through to the coming out of all of that into this totally transformed area of the colony. Walls destroyed, whole sections destroyed. You can't even, you know, you can't do geoponics this month because there is no geoponics. That is completely gone. Mars crosses her arms and sulks. What is the point of having all these kudos if I can't actually use them to, like, buy stuff we need? Like, hello? It's not like I can mail order more supplies for the wormhole. <laughs> Priorities there, Mars. Priorities. Tangent frowns. I just don't understand, she says. Why now? Why does it keep getting worse? This is examining a bit of rubble, turning it over in his hands. I wonder if we're ever going to find, like, alien tech, he says. Wouldn't that be cool? Cal puts on a brave smile. We have a lot to be thankful for, he says. We're still alive. That has to count for something, right? Your mom looks overdrawn with lack of sleep. Be careful out there, she says warily. Don't want anything to happen to you, too. Like the other people in Geoponics, your dad has been working day and night to salvage what he can after the attack. It's gonna be okay, he promises. We just need to work hard. Engineering is crammed with families and what belongings they've salvaged from the destroyed living quarters. You could spend your time in your crowded temporary lodging in a classroom, or help the adults try to fix things. I have enough stress that I could try to help rebuild a little bit here, which I think I will. The first month of quiet passes, each day plodding one after the other. You still have trouble sleeping in the classroom barracks, but there's nowhere else to go. 
Every day you wake with the others and try to make the best of it. Grief and anger come in waves, not just for you, but for everyone. Some days are better than others. You're assigned to help rebuild the walls. The first part of the month is spent just dragging away the wreckage, sorting it into salvage or recycling. By the time that's done, crews disassembling parts of the stratospheric have delivered enough salvage that you can begin work patching up the walls. A sense of urgency permeates the crew. After everything, people need to feel safe. Dis is on the work crew with you, something he does begrudgingly. Walls didn't help the first time, he grumbles whenever anyone asks for his opinion. We should just tear them all down and live like the animals do. If someone planted a bunch of buildings on my land, I'd be pissed off too. No, I'm, uh... I think I'm in this mindset of gotta do whatever it takes now. By the end of the month, you've made noticeable progress. There are other priorities and not a lot of construction material, but when last year's mushwood harvest is done drying out, you'll be able to do more. Even if Dis is right and it didn't help the first time, it's better than nothing. Alright. Gonna say something like that, but that doesn't even get me there. That's worse because I lose the three of a kind. Would a two, three, four help here? That makes it tough. I might just have to use some logs here, which I guess seems appropriate. The sun's finally dawn again on your birthday. You wake early and climb to the top of engineering to watch the first sun's watery rays break the horizon as the wormhole recedes across the sky. Dawn should represent hope after a long period of darkness, but this light only reveals the full extent of the damage to the colony. You've been having trouble sleeping, like most people. It's hard to find rest, crammed into the classroom with all the other kids and their families. And every time you close your eyes, you see... You shake your head to clear the memories. You're so tired. It feels like you've lived this life a hundred times already, and every time, every time, you have to go through this. It feels so colossally unfair. Why are you being tortured like this? You pull your blanket more tightly around your shoulders. Not your blanket, that one's gone. And stare out as the sun rises on the horizon, meager and sickly. Hey kiddo, you hear? Then your mom comes and sits down beside you. Thought I'd find you here. You both sit in silence for a while, watching the sunrise pick out all the broken glass littering the fields, glimmering like a field of stars. After a few minutes, your mom nudges you with her elbow. So, she says, your first apocalypse, huh? She huffs, smiling self-deprecatingly. First one's always the hardest, she sighs. When the first colony was attacked back on Earth, I thought that was it. Everything my parents told me about, the power of community, all that, I thought they were full of shit, too. She turns and gives you a serious look. It's okay to be sad right now. And mad, too. I'm mad as hell. I want to get out there and rip every goddamn mushroom out of the ground. Now that's keeping me going for now. But that's not going to be forever, Selene, she continues. Eventually, that sadness and rage is going to cool, and you have to figure out how to feel after that. She points at your chest. Hope lives here, she says. It's the human condition. We just don't know when to give up. Your mom squints out into the sunrise. I had to figure out how to have hope, too. I needed it to get on a busted-up spaceship with your dad and launch myself through a wormhole. Hope is why we had you. She smiles. Things work out in unusual ways, Selene. It just takes time. You watch the sunrise together for a few more minutes. After a bit, your mom pulls out a little box tied with a piece of gardening twine. From your father and I, she says. Happy birthday, kiddo. You know what it is before you open it. Your old medallion, the one your dad made, with the sun on it to represent Earth, was broken during the attack. In all the chaos, you didn't even notice, but your parents did, and made you a new one. It's just like you remembered. A 
a similar design with a wormhole this time to represent Vertumna. You thank her and squint out at the swirling wormhole still barely visible in the brightening sky. It's so massive and awe-inspiring this time of year, but it always seems to herald disaster. You're happy to watch it fade away into the daylight. Your mom lets out a dark chuckle and slaps you on the back. What a birthday. Here's to another one, right? You both head back downstairs to the wreckage of the canteen, where they've put up temporary roofing with whatever tarps and scraps could be found. The colony nanoprinters, the few that still run, have been working day and night to replace the necessities of life, but larger construction projects are going to take some time. Aunt Anne has coaxed the kitchen nanoprinters into making soy gruel and pressed bars. Life-sustaining, but depressing. You and the other colonists eat your breakfast in stony silence as you mentally prepare for the day. Chief Administrator Seek has taken over as interim governor until the council can elect someone new. Last week they held a mass funeral for everyone who died. There's talk of turning the stratospheric's destroyed front half into a memorial shrine after everything useful has been salvaged. There's still so much to do. It's interesting because um, usually after you get into a new year, you get a little like pop-up screen that says, you know, here's how your year went, here's the new skills you got, here's the new memories you got, give you sort of a status update. It's really interesting that they chose, you know, very deliberately not to do that this year, you know, allowing that moment of the destruction and the deaths to have this moment to breathe and you know you come out into this destroyed area and sort of letting you sit with that rather than you know immediately being like and here's your stats from the game that you're playing uh, so i really i really appreciate that do i see anything new tangent paces outside the engineering wing the only building still standing with everyone living in here there's barely enough room to think This wretched planet, Mars grumbles, gazing at the wreckage of the stratospheric. That was my ship. This anemone is probably still in mourning. Dis is sitting on a pile of rubble, looking out over the colony wreckage. He doesn't look particularly sad. What do you want? Maybe the new colony can have a hoverboard park, Cal says, putting on a brave smile. That'd be pretty cool, right? I can't believe it's all gone, your mom mutters. All that work, gone in one night. It's gotta be so hard on her. It's gonna be okay, your dad says. You'll see, you'll see, kiddo. Pop can fix this. Time to get some rest. Interesting. Is it still letting me do this? Do I still have? Oh, I only have 94 stress. Then yeah, I think I'm gonna keep uh, keep trying to rebuild. You're assigned to help out in geoponics. The agriculturalists have been hard at work trying to salvage what they can of the ruined fields and the destroyed greenhouses, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Your mom is in fine form in her role as chief cultivator. She'll never admit it, but managing a crisis is what she's made for. Cal's working in geoponics too, of course. He smiles when he sees you. Hey, Selene. There's lots of stuff to do. What do you want to work on? Hmm. I don't know. Let's rebuild the animal pens. The pens only suffered minor damage during the attack. Weirdly, most of the damage seems to have come from inside the pens, as if the normally tame animals had been stirred into a frenzy. Hmm. Tangent is also here, though it's not to help hammer and nail things. She's studying the animals, trying to figure out what could have influenced them. She takes blood and hair samples and readings with some sort of complicated brain scanning device. Interesting, is all she says, not explaining her findings to you or Cal. Everyone is worried that this will be the final nail in the coffin for your food supply after the famine last year. You try not to think about it too hard, instead focusing on just doing what you can to help rebuild. Oof, oof, oof. Four, that's a four. That becomes an eight. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. 
You're eating in the mess tents when you hear something rumbling. Your bowl and cutlery start rattling. People look around in alarm. Could it be another attack so soon? You begin to hear shouting from outside. Someone runs into the tent. There's something falling from the sky, they shout. It's on fire. You join the crowd of people leaving your temporary structures to gather in the colony square. People are squinting up into the milky, quiet sunlight, pointing and gesturing widely. It's impossible to miss the thing hurtling towards you from space, like a great big ball of fire coming straight for you. Is this it? Is this the end? After all you've been through, a meteor's going to land in the middle of your already ruined colony and kill you all? That's no meteor. Mars grabs your shoulder. It's another ship, she exclaims. Look, look, it's another spaceship from Earth. Excitement ripples through the crowd. Could it be? You stare up, unbelieving, at the rapidly approaching ship. The flames of its entry into the atmosphere dissipate, but a thick column of greasy black smoke trails behind it. Soon you can hear the whistle of it ripping through the atmosphere at terminal velocity. That is not a controlled descent. It's an enormous ship coming at you way too fast. The ship's reverse thrusters fire, trying to slow it down so it doesn't smash into a billion pieces when it hits the planet. Everyone scatters to take cover. You crouch behind some rocks, throw your arms over your head, and squeeze your eyes shut. You hear the massive spaceship touch down in geoponics, plowing through the fields and grinding over what was left of the greenhouses. You're thrown to the ground from the force of the impact as shrapnel and small rocks zing past your head. It grinds along like some roaring monster, cutting a great scar through the colony and kicking up an enormous cloud of dust. Finally, the ship comes to a creaking, shuddering halt. You and the other colonists carefully crawl out of your hiding places, coughing and rubbing your eyes. The new ship is half buried and obscured by dust, but you can tell it's from Earth. You squint to make out the stenciled letters. Heliopause. A hatch opens in its side. And silhouettes begin to emerge. Silhouettes with guns. Soldiers march out of the dust and quickly surround all of the remaining colonists. More soldiers form two parallel lines from the ship to the square, their guns in parade rest, and a lone figure strides down the center towards you. Greetings, fugitives of Earth, the man says, spreading his hands wide. This asshole. A dismayed murmur ripples through the crowd. The adults exchange significant looks. Chief Engineer Instance tries to slip out of the crowd, but she's stopped by the line of soldiers. The man smiles. He has a broad, easygoing smile that doesn't match the threatening aura of the soldiers, nor the smoking ruin of the ship behind him. I am Commander Lum, he says proudly. As captain of the Heliopause, I have come to render aid and bring you to justice. The fuck is happening? Seek steps forward out of the crowd. You're not the commander of the Heliopause, they say firmly. Governor Uticott was expecting Commander Morikawa. Everyone is surprised. Uticott had been in communication with this ship? For how long? I am captain of the Heliopause, Lum repeats stubbornly, then adds, according to the chain of command, we uh, sustained significant loss of personnel when we went through the wormhole. You can't help but notice many of these soldiers exchange looks this time. You wonder how many people had to die before Lum became commander. As the commanding officer, Lum continues, Oops, I dare, uh, I declare this colony to be under our protection. As such, you are all now subject to the laws of Earth. Seek bows. N now, they stammer, there's no need for dramatics. We're a diminished colony, as you see. Governor Uticott died in the most recent attack, after all. We're quite leaderless. Lum's eyes search the crowd, landing on your mom. She stares right back at him, as if daring him to say something. You notice Chief Engineer Instance is being held with her arms behind her back. She glowers at Lum with unbridled hatred. Lum turns to the assembled colonists. Well, why don't we fix that, he declares. Say hello to your new governor. You hear a few gasps of shock and outrage, and Lum raises his hands placatingly. Let's not pretend you don't need our help, he says, and we could simply arrest you instead, but there's no need to demoralize your little colony further. Judging from the number of guns on display, you don't think you have a choice in this. It's a good thing the colony is in such pathetic shape right now, your mom mutters under her breath. If they thought we were a threat, they'd probably just have shot us. Your dad squeezes your shoulders and tells her to be quiet. No one knows how to react. A new governor from Earth? Nearly a hundred new colonists, most of them trained soldiers. What does this mean for the colony? The crowd disperses slowly, and the council members follow Lum back into the heliopause, presumably to talk about the future of the colony. 
you hope. You track down your friends. So what do you think of these new people? Mars asks. <laughs> Glad they're here to save us. We said to make new friends. They're just going to boss us around. I don't want to share this planet. I mean, I don't think I'm... <coughs> So going to uh, jump into bed with them so quickly. You know, we have to do what we can. It's sort of the, the arc I've been doing, whatever it takes, but not happy about them. Certainly not Lum. They're just going to boss us around. Tangent nods. They don't live here. They don't know what it's like. And they're just going to swoop in and act like they're better than us. She hugs her arms around herself. Did you see what they were doing to Instance? The entire colony, now twice as many of you, sets to work on salvaging the wreckage of the heliopause, tearing it down and combining it with the stratospheric's remaining engine section. Spirits are high, though these new colonists from the heliopause aren't like any people you've ever met before. With their uniforms and weapons, they're more like an invading force than a rescue. You aren't so sure what this means for the colony, or for your future. As the dust settles, you rebuild your colony around this new ship, the Heliopause. The new arrivals, soldiers mainly, are aloof at first. Many see you as fugitives. Together, you build new walls, living quarters, greenhouses, and a massive bunkered garrison. The Stratos Engineering Wing is the only reminder of your old colony. The Heliopause brought enough rations for another five years, as well as a rich seed bank and working hydroponics. They also have more guns and explosives than you've ever seen in your life. Even the ship has guns. A full stomach, a roof over your heads, and the promise of safety convinces most stratocolonists to accept the Helios. In turn, the Helios decide that you criminals pose little threat. A grudging peace is brokered between the two groups. You decide they aren't so different, really. There are even Helio children, born among the stars just like you. After a month of hard work, you and your parents move into your new quarters. You get your own room for the first time in your life. You step out onto your very own balcony to watch the new colony, its grounds bustling with so many strangers and strange new ideas. You feel something rising in your chest that you haven't felt in some time. Hope. Excitement. What will the new day bring? You better get out there and find out. Cautiously step outside. So whole new colony, whole new fascists, same as the old fascists, I guess. First time I played this game, oh, new people, I can't wait to talk to them, or if Rex, uh, first time I played this game, when that happened, had this moment of just needing to take a minute. I mean, it's a lot, both the destruction and then these fucking fascists coming in. It was definitely, it was tough. I mean, it was, it's one of those things where like, you know, as a, as a writer, as a narrative designer, you know that something like this has to happen, right? You need that, that shift in the story. Uh, that, you know, moment of change of climax to, you know, set the stage for what comes next and set up all of the new things that are going to come. Uh, you know, we're only halfway through the game. I knew there were other characters and I didn't know sort of how they were going to arrive. It all makes sense. It makes for a great story, makes for a great conflict, makes for some great options going forward. But it's still one of those things that you got to take a moment I think I saved and just walked around for half an hour and before I was able to come back and, and keep going just to like get my mind in the place of like okay this is this is what's happening now it's just something that we're gonna have to deal with obviously lots to talk about some new characters Nami Rex and Vase this is the other character that I've never made friends with because well because he's an asshole um 
but one that I want to get to know better in this playthrough. That's one of my primary goals here, is going to be get to know him a lot better and his relationship with Anemone as we, uh, as we go forward. But realistically, with that uh, major climactic moment and lots of new characters to meet and whatnot, I think it's probably a great place to uh, wrap up this stream, a sort of solid, perfect two hours. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to call it there and save. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming and watching uh, or coming back to watch the video on demand, if that's what you're doing or, or whatever it is. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're trying to grow this little channel, um, get your affiliate status. We can do some cool community stuff, emotes and all that fun stuff. So please do give us a follow if you haven't yet. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, I'm Lucas. I am the studio director at Silver String Media. We're a small indie game studio in Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, BC. Uh, we just released uh, our first major studio game called Glitch Hikers The Spaces Between uh, back at the end of March this year, which we're really proud of. Go check that out, glitchhikers.com, or lots of info and links in the description down here on Twitch. Um, and yeah, we're, we're trying out some streaming and, and playing some games that we enjoy. Exocolonist is, uh, I think, my favorite game of 2022, a fun narrative experience, so really fun to, to dive in from that perspective as well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you so much for coming and checking us out. Again, please do give us a follow. And uh, I will be back next week to see all of the wonderful changes that, <laughs> wonderful changes that have happened as the result of... Uh, the arrival of the Heliopause. I mean, I will say, the appearance of Rex is definitely uh, a wonderful change that I will be happy about. But the rest of it, you know, the fascists and stuff, maybe not so much. We'll see how it goes. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>